Well, thank you so much, Professor, uh, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I would like to, first of all, make one correction, because uh, Professor Chen actually omitted only 25 years of my life. Because actually, after I graduated from law school and did all these good things where you educate yourself and train into trying to be helpful um, in your professional life, I actually joined a law firm. And I was a practicing attorney for quite a few years. And luckily, that has actually brought me to Hong Kong very often because my firm was Baker McKenzie. And uh, we had a fantastic office here in Hong Kong. And I came here very often to visit colleagues uh, in this beautiful city of, of Hong Kong. And as always, when I come and visit Hong Kong, uh, in the past, as today, no matter what changes have taken place in the meantime, and there have been many, I'm always struck by the, uh, the energy, the inventivity, the ability of Hong Kong and Hong Kongers to actually uh, adapt, have this unbelievable capacity to not only adjust, but shape. Uh, change around them, and that applies to the architecture as much as it applies to their professions uh, as well. You know, clearly moving from uh, that manufacturing powerhouse to a global trade uh, engine to this world-class financial centers uh, that is uh, rivaled by many others, uh, it really reflects its commitment to openness, and we will talk about openness, uh, to the ability to combine homegrown talent uh, with fresh ideas and expertise from all across the world uh, that actually come together here in, in Hong Kong. And this issue of openness is clearly um, a good way to uh, be a little bit more sensitive to changes. And uh, Hong Kongers are keenly aware that economic history never actually moves in a linear way but moves in cycles. And they know that when the economy is moving, whether it's moving up or down, and I'm not here talking just about the stock market, policymakers cannot afford to stand still. And that is also the story of the global economy. The world at the moment is going through a really strong upswing. Now, I heard Professor Chen say that we were not in the spotlight which doesn't mean to say that we don't have much to do. <laughs> and I'll try to demonstrate that. But that upswing uh, actually holds the promise of higher income, better living standards. And delivering on that promise is actually critical, not just here in Asia, but around the world, particularly after what people have gone through in terms of financial crisis back 10 years ago. Now, we at the IMF have been calling on all governments to use the current growth momentum for much needed policy actions and reforms, particularly in the labor markets and in the service market. Now this is what I have borrowed from John Fitzgerald Kennedy when he said, it's when the sun is shining that you actually want to fix the roof. And we very much believe that this is time to do so. These reforms that I've just mentioned are politically difficult, but they are much easier to conduct and implement when there is growth momentum. Some governments have taken action, but much more needs to be done, and in many corners of the world. We believe that the window of opportunity is opened, but we also believe that there is new urgency because uncertainties have significantly increased. From trade tensions, frictions, to rising financial and fiscal risks, to more uncertain geopolitics. So how we can actually sustain that upswing in the face of these rising risks, and how we can foster longer-term growth that benefits all, are the two key questions that I believe about 160 or so finance ministers and about as many central bank governors will be asking themselves and asking each other next week when they all gather in Washington DC for the spring meetings. And those are the issues that I would like to discuss with you today. So what I will do is very quickly broad brush the state of the global economy as we see it and as we forecast it, and then identify the three priorities which I believe can actually 
help with sustaining that upswing and creating a more solid longer term growth. So as I said, at the moment, the sun is shining. We are clearly seeing a momentum that is driven by stronger investment, a rebound in trade, and favorable financial conditions. And all of that converging, converging actually drives companies and households to actually increase their spending. And that's the reason, you know, this nice momentum that we're seeing at the moment, which brings us almost back to the average that we had pre-financial crisis. That's the reason why back in January at the IMF, we forecasted growth in 2018 and 2019 at 3.9%. We will be publishing our latest uh, forecast in April, and you will see that we continue to be uh, optimistic. Now, where does that growth come from? Advanced economies are expected to grow above their medium-term potential this year and next. If you look at Europe, for instance, the upswing is now more widely spread across the whole region. The United States is already at full employment and growth will likely accelerate further due to expansionary fiscal policy. Here in Asia, the outlook remains bright. And if we look at only emerging Asia, we are forecasting growth at about 6.5%. And that is good, not just for Asia or emerging Asia, which is the number that I just gave you. It's good for the entire world, because Asia is actually fueling almost two-thirds of that 3.9% growth. Japan's economy continued to grow strongly. We see it at about 1.2%. And Asian emerging markets, led by China, 6.6%, India, 7.4%, are driven by higher domestic consumption and also rising exports. This is the bright side of things. We have countries with challenges, particularly in emerging and low-income countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. They benefit from commodity uh, prices increase, particularly the exporters, but that's a modest upswing. So the current picture, as I have just described it quickly, is indeed bright. But if we look at the horizon, we see clouds looming and probably getting a bit darker. And the reality is that this economic momentum is probably which we expect for 2018 and 2019, is probably going to eventually slow down. Now, why is that? It will slow down because of the fading fiscal stimulus that we are seeing now in countries like the United States or China. It will slow down because of rising interest rates, and it will be rising probably because of tighter financial conditions as major central banks around the world, starting with the Fed, but moving on probably to the ECB and thereon, will actually normalize monetary policy. And if you add to that the issue of aging population in many advanced but also some emerging countries and weaker productivity, you have a challenging medium-term outlook, especially in the advanced world. So what can policymakers do to address that? And I come to my three key priorities. Priority number one, governments need to steer clear of protectionism in all its forms. History shows us that import restrictions hurt everyone, especially the poorer consumers. Not only do they lead to more expensive products and more limited choices, but they also prevent trade from playing its essential role of boosting productivity and spreading new technologies. For those of you who are interested in the role that trade plays in spreading technologies, I highly recommend a publication that we just released about that particular phenomenon. And as a result of that, even protected industries, as, as a result of those protectionist measures, 
eventually suffer as they become less dynamic than their foreign competitors because they are protected from competition. Yet, as we see it, discussions about trade restrictions are often bound up with the concept of trade deficit and surpluses. And some people argue that these imbalances indicate unfair trade practices. Hmm. <laughs> the half-asleep lawyer inside myself, which has done a lot of competition law, is actually rejoicing. More business to be had. But yes, there are unfair practices. Of course, there are unfair practices. And if they are not eliminated, if they are not addressed, they can leave their mark on trade balances between two countries. But in general, these bilateral imbalances are a snapshot of the division of labor across economies, including global value chain. Let me give you an example. A country that focuses on assembling smartphones assembling smartphones, will tend to have a deficit, a bilateral trade deficit, with countries that produce the, compo the components of those smartphones, and will tend to have surpluses with countries that actually buy the finished device. That's what I mean by the value chain and the induced results in terms of deficits and surpluses. But more importantly, Unfair trade practices have little impact on a country's overall trade deficit with the rest of the world. And that is really what matters. That imbalance is driven by the fact that global, that, that imbalance versus the rest of the world, that imbalance is driven by the fact that a country spends more than its income. The best way to address these macroeconomic imbalances it is not to impose tariffs, it is not to raise barriers, but to use policies that affect the economy as a whole, such as fiscal tools or structural reforms. Let me take two countries' example. One which is in a, a deficit situation vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, and another one which is in a surplus situation. The first one is at the United States, which could certainly help tackle excessive global imbalances by curbing gradually the dynamics of its public spending and increasing revenues, which would help reduce, in turn, future fiscal deficits, particularly in the context of rising entitlements. Second example, Germany. Germany, which is facing an aging population, could use its excess savings to boost its growth potential, including through investment in physical and digital infrastructures. So I've tried to explain what we see about these global or bilateral imbalances, what is causing them, causing them and how they can be addressed. Let me now try to see what policymakers can do about unfair trade practices. In that respect, each country has a responsibility to improve the trade system by looking at its own practices and by committing to a level playing field where all countries will be following the rules. Now, this includes, of course, better protection of intellectual property, reducing the distortion of policies that favor state enterprises. It also means trading by the rules the WTO rules that all 164 countries have actually agreed upon. Now, we can all do more, but we cannot do it alone. Remember, the multilateral system that transformed our world over the past generation helped reduce by half the proportion of the global population living in extreme poverty. It has reduced the cost of living, particularly for the poorest consumers, and it has created millions of new jobs with higher wages. But that system of 
Open trade based on rules and shared responsibility is now in danger of being torn apart. And this would, in our view, be an inexcusable collective policy failure. So what can we do? We can redouble our efforts to reduce trade barriers and resolve disagreements without using exceptional measures. We can work together to build on forward-looking trade initiatives, including, for instance, the recent agreement that was concluded between Japan and the European Union, or the new Pan-African Continental Free Trade Treaty, and the so-called TPP-11. Those are examples of countries actually deciding to pull together and to resolve issues together, not alone. We can also ensure that policies help those affected by dislocations, whether from trade or from technological advances. We should consider the benefits of scaling up investment in training and in social safety nets so that workers can actually upgrade their skills and transition to higher quality jobs or be supported if that option is not available. Because yes, it is true that trade actually affects some industries, some regions, as a result of this supply chain that I was referring to. But it is not because of that that the systems should be overhauled. The system has to be fixed in its negative aspects, and there are policies for that. So, as I said, if we're, not in the stop, in, if we're not in the spotlight at the moment, we, we are not uh, inactive, I can assure you. And uh, we are supporting our members through analysis, through surveillance, through advice, by offering a platform of dialogue and cooperation. This is a mandatory exercise that we have been doing for 70 years, and we will continue doing so. That's what we were set up to do, actually, back in Bretton Woods in 1944. Our experience over more than seven decades shows that when countries work together, they can actually resolve issues in a much better way. And we need that spirit of cooperation if we want to avoid protectionism and to sustain the global upswing. So that was my priority, priority number one. My priority number two is that we need to guard against fiscal and financial risks. And here, numbers actually speak for themselves. There is a new IMF analysis that is also just being published now, which will really uh, tell you a lot more about this debt situation that I'm going to talk about now. What that analysis shows is that after a decade of easy financial conditions, remember QE, accommodative pol monetary policies, interest rates below zero, necessary as it was. But that decade of easy financial conditions, as a result of that, global debt, both public and private, has reached an all-time high of $164 trillion. Wow, that's a big number, but we have no idea what it actually represents, until I tell you that it's 220% of global GDP. Now, some numbers must be floating around for you. Japan debt to GDP, US debt to GDP. This 60% optimum that the European Union partners have set for themselves, which Germany might actually uh, even do better than that. 220% of global GDP. That is a lot. Compared to its 2007 level, remember just pre-financial crisis, Compared with that, this debt today is now 40% higher with China alone accounting for just over 40% of that increase relative to 2007. Now, a, major, a majority of this buildup of debt is actually the private sector, which makes up two-thirds of the total debt level in the world. But that is not the whole story. Public debt in advanced economies is at levels that we have not seen since the Second World War. Altogether, advanced economies, 107% of GDP. 
And if recent trends continue, many low-income countries will face unsustainable debt burdens. And that's an issue because high debt in low-income countries could actually jeopardize development goals as governments actually have to pay more to service than their debt than they should actually spend on education, health, and infrastructure. So the bottom line is that high debt burdens have left governments, companies, households more vulnerable to a sudden tightening of financing conditions, which if you remember what I said earlier, will inevitably happen as the situation improves. This potential shift could prompt market corrections, debt sustainability concerns, and capital flow reversal in emerging markets in particular. So I'm going back to the sun is shining, we need to fix the roof. Because we need to use the current window of opportunity to prepare for the challenge ahead. And that is about creating more room to act when the next downturn inevitably comes. We need to do what the economists call rebuild the buffers. Now, what does that mean specifically? For many economies, it means reducing government deficits, strengthening fiscal framework, and placing public debt on a gradual downward path. Are you going to strangle growth? No, it should be done in a growth-friendly fashion through more efficient spending and progressive taxation. That's on the fiscal front. On the financial and monetary front, it calls for more exchange rate flexibility in order to cope with volatile capital flows, especially in emerging and developing countries. Now, are buffers really useful? Hmm. Many have asked the question, actually. We believe that they are useful because these efforts actually help reduce the severity and the duration of the next recession. For example, a recent study by Professor Romer shows that the decline in output after a financial crisis is less than 1% in a country with adequate fiscal and monetary buffers, but almost 10% in a country with no buffers. It is worth the effort of rebuilding the buffers. But it is not enough. We've talked about fiscal buffers, we've talked about financial monetary buffers. Strengthening financial stability by increasing buffer in corporate and banking systems is also key, especially in large emerging market economies such as China and India. And that means reducing corporate debt, bolstering bank capital and liquidity where needed. It also means implementing policies to address booming housing markets. Here we are in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is also concerned by such issue. And again, for those of you who are interested in those variation of housing markets and how they evolve around the world, I highly recommend another study that we're just publishing, which is uh, provided by the, what we call the Global Financial Stability Report. And it shows that housing markets in major cities across the world are increasing more and more in tandem. Now, why is that a concern? Because if it starts in one particular country, in one particular market, it could very likely be amplified by an across the board similar movement affecting those housing markets that move up together and will most likely move down together. So we also need global buffers. For one thing, we must keep the financial system safe. It was hard in 2008. I was finance minister for France, and I have very vivid memories of those days and how dramatic it was and how deposits of savers could actually have vanished. So we need to secure the work that has been done to actually reinforce this financial, these financial markets. 
We need to avoid a rollback of the regulatory framework that was put in place since the crisis to boost capital and to increase liquidity buffers. It is tempting to forget what happened 10 years ago. I know. But we need to have that very clear in our mind. And the international regulatory framework needs to keep pace with the rapidly evolving fintech landscape in order to do two things. One is to head off new risks, but also to harness the potential of fintechs. And finally, we need a strong global financial safety net overall. And here the IMF plays a critical role at the center of that global safety net by helping countries to better cope with capital flow volatility in times of distress. So together, these policy actions will actually help sustain the upswing, steer clear of protectionism, rebuild the buffers and guard against the fiscal and the financial risks. Now what I'd like to do now is turn a little bit to the longer term. You remember I mentioned that some of the advanced economies are actually growing above their medium term potential. Well, we need to tackle that medium term potential and make sure that it is actually improved over the course of time and time begins now. If, as we project, assuming nothing is done on that front, advanced economies return to disappointing medium-term growth, this would worsen economic inequality, debt concerns, and political pol polarization that we observe in many corners of the world. And at the same time, remember those countries in sub-Saharan Africa that I mentioned earlier? Well, 40 of them at the moment, whether emerging or developing, are projected to grow more slowly in per capita terms than advanced economies. This means slower improvement in living standards and a widening income gap between those countries and the advanced world, when in fact we had anticipated that the convergence path would accelerate. This is not being demonstrated in many of those countries. As I said earlier, the window of opportunity is open, but to boost productivity and potential growth, countries need to step up economic reforms and policy actions. So I'm going to focus only on two of those that we regard as potentially game changers. First, we should unlock the potential of the service sector, especially in developing countries. In moving from an agriculture-based to a service-based economy, many of these countries are bypass bypassing the industrial phase. And this raises concern. Concerns that countries could get stuck at lower, producti lower producti productivity levels with little chance of catching up to the advanced economy's income. Again, another piece of research just published now shows that some service sectors, not all, but some service sectors led by transportation, communication, and business services can actually match the, producti the productivity level of manufacturing. Now, there are some countries for which it's absolutely critical. Countries like the Philippines, like Ghana, like Colombia, which are heading exactly in that direction. And that's good news. It's also critical for, for the well-being of millions of women who often account for a majority of the service industry workers. Now, it's not going to happen just like that. It's going to require the unlocking of that potential. It requires more public investment in education, in training, in job search assistance. It also means opening service sectors to more competition. And at the global level, there is work to be done as well. We need to increase trade in services, including e-commerce, by reducing barriers in this area. Barriers in those service areas are extremely high. So that's my first game changer. Good news on the service front and its productivity in some sectors policy action investment in order to unlock that potential. 
My second potential game changer is the digital transformation that applies across the board. But I'm, I'm not going to describe for you the digital transformation of the day. We would need another couple of days. I'm only going to focus on what impact it has on government. Because when it comes to cutting edge technologies, actually, public sector can lead the way. And in some countries, they have. If you, anybody of you is here is from Estonia, you know it. But we're also seeing great examples here in Asia. In India, citizens receive subsidies and welfare payments directly into their bank accounts, which are linked to unique biometric identifiers. Massive transformation at play. Much more security for many people, including women. In Australia, tax authorities collect information on wages in real time, which gives them immediate insight into the state of the economy. And I am told that here in Hong Kong, bank customers will soon be able to use their mobile phone numbers and email addresses to transfer money or make retail purchases thanks to a new government-funded payment system that is supposed to roll out as of next September. So these initiatives are just the beginning. Government across the world are now also looking at ways of generating efficiency gains. There's one study, not published by the IMF, this one, that estimates that almost 20% of public revenue worldwide, that is no less than $5 trillion, go missing each year because of tax non-compliance and misdirected government payments. By using new tools, such as big data analysis, governments can actually reduce these leakages which are often directly related to corruption and tax evasion. Reducing leakages will actually empower governments to actually spend money where it is needed. Those sectors that I've mentioned earlier, education, health, infrastructure. So the bottom line is that digital government can actually deliver public services more efficiently, more effectively, and help people's lives. When you consider that today, more households in developing countries now have access to di digital technology, such as internet, such as the use of smartphones, more access to that than actually access to water or secondary education, it tells us the potential that digital can actually unleash and how much effort we have to put into financing the infrastructure project that will bring water to households. So let me conclude. Sometimes we are struck by those new faces, generally younger, probably much more digitally literate than previous ones. I'm talking here about those new policy makers you know those new leaders, many corners of the world, under the age of 40 for some? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're facing multiple challenges, but they should feel more equipped to actually deal with them. They have multiple choice. They can simply repeat the mistakes of the past that have cost us so dearly or they can copy policies of the past, which have delivered mixed results, raising living standards substantially, but leaving too many behind. Or they can decide to paint a new economic landscape where open trade is fairer and more collaborative, where financial systems are safer and more supportive of economic growth, and where the digital revolution benefits not just the fortunate few, but all people. Now, I've often lauded the virtue of courage, but I believe that in the present circumstances, it's a combination of collaborative courage, collective determination to actually transform our economies 
so that economic underlying factors do not come to exacerbate differences, hamper diversity that we so badly need in this world. I thank you very much.